Warning, please be advised. The following video contains graphic scenes of players suffering catastrophic injuries from helmet hits during live football competition. This video is not meant to entertain. Its sole purpose is to enlighten and motivate the public to establish the evidence-based Hosea Method tackling technique as the national standard of care for teaching tackling at the youth and high school levels of tackle football competition. Parental discretion is advised. In order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle to try and change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. Richard Buckminster Fuller, owner of 24 Patents. Wide-eyed blind. Game in crisis. Be enlightened. Take action. Oh, but there is the, and they collide helmet to helmet too. My name is David Deacon Jones, born in Eatonville, Florida in the year of our Lord, 1938. I rose out of the ashes of segregation into the best defensive end to ever play this game. I come to try to tear your damn head off. That is why I'm a lot reluctant about advising anybody to play this game. Because I know what my mental capacity was. I'd take you down in a minute. I'd put you in the hospital in a minute and didn't care nothing about it. One of our coaches, Wilson Matthews, was asked to give the prayer. He said, protect these boys. Have them play as good as they can and have them represent their state well. Amen. Now nail him to the cross. Good hit! The worst of all possible things is to spear somebody. Because what happens is if you, if you take the force on the top of your head, there's no place for your bones to go. And as far as the forces go, if you hit someone with your head, you are more likely to make your head stop quickly. You are also very likely to make the other guy's head go whoosh, and it's going to create large accelerations and decelerations of your head, but your brain ain't going to know it, and it's going to go whoosh. It's like watching two donkeys fight over an apple, you know. We get serious about that football, you know. We're going to go there to put some hurt on somebody. Seventy, eighty-year-old grandmothers up in the stands saying, "Kill him, take his head off." led to by leading with one's head. And if you do that, you're putting yourself at risk. There's no question about that. In making a proper tackle, it should be made with the hands, it should be made with a body, and a large use of the shoulders. The hands should never 
be behind the head. The head should never be lowered. The head should never be the initial point of contact. But a helmet is not a weapon, it's, it's a protection. And you hit that person with the top of your head, your spine will break. When you have people striking with their head and you have two helmets colliding, something's gotta give. Your head's gonna stop and it's gonna stop fast. Your skull is going to stop, boom. The impact causes a violent shaking of the brain inside the skull. It is like two cars coming together head-on-head -head collision. The brain is spun, it's torqued, it's rotated so that nerve cells and their fibers are stretched and torn. Nothing good can happen from it, put it that way. Now, if you are bigger and faster and you do hit harder, like a Mack truck hitting a Volkswagen, then uh, you're not going to be injured. The Volkswagen's going to be smashed. I think when you're young, if you have improper technique and you get your head, head caught down or to the side the wrong way, you have a very good chance of hurting yourself, hurting your neck, or, or, or getting a concussion. Youngsters are more susceptible to injury. They recover more slowly and forces that would not cause injury in an adult with a well-developed neck do cause injury in a youngster. They're clearly more vulnerable. I can barely like breathe. All I can do is like blink. That's like the only movement I had. I was always the first one at the game, one of the first people at the game because I wanted to get the best seat to see him come out. I just saw black and then I just fell and couldn't feel anything. You want to hug him and make everything better and I couldn't touch him. Because I was like crying on the field because I just didn't know what was going on. But then I just, it was kind of hard to breathe and stuff so it was kind of hard to cry. So I just stopped crying. But they were like, you have like a really serious break in your neck and everything. And I was just like, I was like in shock. I never thought that would happen, but. He's been playing football since he was three. So it was the first football game that I actually missed. The reality for the doctor says zero. But for me, I've, I've seen my, my son walk several times in my dreams. And he was like, well, mom, even if I don't get to walk again, I want to be an architect. So just have him to, to fix my hands. He said, have him to fix my hands because I want to be an architect I can draw. He was like, save your money. I was like, okay, honey, I'm going to save my money. And I walked out of the room. And I walked around the corner and I prayed and I cried and I prayed. He's my only son. My only son. I'd vomit sometimes. I would kind of hide it from coaches. If coaches saw me vomiting, they'd say, no court, you can't go back in. So I'd hide it from them because I wanted to play that bad. Second impact syndrome is where a youngster's concussion has not healed and then another hit, even a relatively minor one, causes a cascade of just terrible, terrible events inside the brain that can quite literally cause all but instant death. They ran a kind of a sweep to the outside and court came up and, and made it a tackle. The next thing I know is I hear one of the coaches screaming my name. He was on the sideline and, and then the next thing you know he, he, he lost consciousness. And we pulled his helmet off of him and, and there's just nobody home. He won't respond to pain, he won't respond to my voice. And I figured he was going to die right there. They removed the entire right hemisphere of his skull. And as soon as they did that, the, the brain just bulged out. It was just in there, just crying. So you think if you had to do it all over again, you would change something? Mm -hmm. I'd still play football. Okay. I figured you would. I'd just play it more safely.
we were called into the room, and the doctor told us and gave us the you know, word that uh, Chris would be paralyzed from the shoulders down. We were not prepared for what we were going to see. I think the reality of, of the injury and the seriousness of the injury really set home. And we just sat there and cried. Just shut down. I didn't want to go to class. I didn't want to do anything. Because he, he, he knew nobody knew what he was going through. We didn't know what he was going through. You feel so useless that you feel I'd rather die than not be able to do anything, you know? So, I mean, that depression will really eat you up. I still talk to, to kids on that team that are affected by his injury. You know, they feel like it's their fault. There are several people's lives that were affected by, by that, by that one play. Paul Williams played wide receiver for the Tennessee Titans. My brother Curtis um, kind of get it choked up talking about it. He played at the University of Washington and ended up with his spinal cord injury. And I was actually at the game at Stanford. He went with his head down and um, kind of got rocked back a little bit. At first, I was, um, I kind of laughed a little bit. I'm like, oh, Kurt's going to be mad when he gets up from that because, you know, he's known as the big hitter. And he, and he didn't get up. I just remember that feeling. It was kind of like I got sick to my, kind of like sick to my stomach. He was in a coma for two weeks. He couldn't even breathe on his own. In the profession that I'm in, it's like every time you put on your cleats, every time you put on your pads, I think, I think about my brother Curtis. So there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about that. And um, I mean, it's hard to not to think about it, but it's something that happens. Forever, youngsters have emulated those that play the sports at the highest level. Not here. Here comes a ton of time and throws, and that's caught by McIntyre. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that he's done it again. Dante Robinson again. There was plenty of time to react on that one. That is awful. That's how people get seriously hurt in this right. game. Just go out there and play hard. You know, I've been a hitter since I was seven years old. You know, I've in, in Pop Warner, I was knocking people out of football games. You know, so it's not about being dirty. It's just about going to play the way I play football. Kids see that and they think because it's exciting, that's who they want to be. That's how they want to tackle. And we fight that every day. And we get kids that try to uh, emulate, you know, that action. It's a battle. It's a battle. And it's hard to explain to them that this guy who's in the pros that should know everything there is to know about hitting that he doesn't. The payoff is you got a kid that tackles safely and he's going to have a, a healthy life after football. Some people don't. Some people say, well, I like to hit guys when they're not watching. Well, watch. Look, it's football, you know. You look at the James Harrison hit, you look at all of these hits, whatever they may be. The bottom line is those are hits that, you know, you go into the, your defensive room, you're getting praised for. You know, because that's the way you so the game of football is supposed to be played. It's not a game for, for wimps, if you will. We're going to be playing flag football in about five years. I only know one way to play this game. You still see pros to this day dropping their heads, tackling incorrectly, eyes to the ground, because that's the way they were taught. At their, when they were youth and in high school, that's how they were taught. And these youth players, they look up to professional athletes. That's who they want to be. Their dream goal at, fo at this youth football level is to be in the NFL. So they're going to want to do what that NFL player does. If I had a 10-year-old boy, I don't know that I'd be real inclined to encourage him to go play football in light of what we are learning from head injury. I'd hit people a lot with my head. That's sort of my main thing. My helmet kind of shows uh, all the marks and the, how much I've hit people. Fortunately now, with the technology and helmets and the amount of padding that they have, it's, it's basically like your head sitting in a basket, even to the point where if I hit someone really hard, it doesn't, it doesn't really hurt. Using the helmet as the initial point of contact and blocking and tackling works 
in the shorthand for that particular play, effectively achieving what you want, but it is putting your head and your neck at greater risk of long-term injury. An R.J. Reynolds High School sophomore linebacker, Mackett Feller, was seriously injured during Friday night's game. Reynolds' team doctor told WXII 12 News that Feller was taken to the hospital where he was undergoing emergency brain surgery. Now there are studies being done on the brains of former NFL players looking at advanced dementia. What they show is three times rated depression, five times rated dementia, and people who have three concussions or more. These brown blotches mark the accumulation of tau protein, an abnormal substance that can emerge within the brain after repeated blows to the head. I have friends who are in their 30s who are taking Alzheimer's medicine because they've had issues with concussion that are putting them into bouts of depression and different things like that. Uh, it's a violent sport, it's an entertaining sport, and at some point the NFL is going to have to think about the morality and not just the wealth. Mike Webster, my former center, passed away. A lot of head problems. Living in a car, living under a bridge. NFL take care of him? No, not at all. And that's why this bothers me. I'm not so sure they really care that much about these players. A shocking suicide by a former NFL player draws attention to the hard-hitting game of football. Former Chicago Bears safety Dave Duerson was found dead last Thursday. He shot himself in the chest because he told family members he wanted doctors to study his brain. He left a note and text message asking for his brain to be studied reading, please see that my brain is given to the NFL's brain bank. It is with mixed emotions that my family and I stand before you today. It is my greatest hope that his death will not be in vain and that through this research, his legacy will live on and that others will not have to suffer in the same manner. The trauma team came out and explained to me what was going on said that he had broken his neck. Before the game even started, I was with my girlfriend at the time. I just had this weird feeling that something was going to happen. She was really good to me. Like the first few months this happened, but I guess she got kind of bored. And she just didn't want to be confined. We just went our separate ways. There are several people's lives that were affected by that one play. When I was in um, ICU, I flatlined twice. We almost lost Chris on three separate occasions. I went to rehab in Dallas, and I spent six months in a rehab facility away from home. I'd had uh, feeding tubes in my stomach that they would have to feed me through until I relearned how to swallow them. I think about the children that are paralyzed, these little boys, and I think about their parents. And I can only imagine the first thought is, I can't die now. I can't die now because who's going to look out for him if I'm gone? That's what we're talking about. When you think about it, Kids are putting on pads and tackling as young as seven years old. Those are babies. What's at stake here is my son's life and the life of his family. Horrible stuff happens when safety goes out the window when it comes to tackling. Having organized uh, groups that can teach the proper way to tackle to minimize the, uh, the use of the head, uh, that's a key thing. Most spinal cord injuries in football occur in the act of tackling and tackling improperly. Right now, we need to make effective steps that make the game as safe as possible so that we can enjoy it, because it is America's game. You know, unless you learn this at an early age, whether it be in, in a grade school program or a high school program, chances are you're not gonna be able to do it. I, I think it would be a great thing to have these clinics put on by college pro high school coaches when they teach kids to tackle. I think by emphasizing the proper technique, starting with young kids, the technique of never using your head as a projectile, uh, never hitting with your head down, I think if we're able to keep emphasizing that, then I think we'll make a big difference. Uh, I'm not saying I would have gotten hurt or not. I'm just saying that if a lot of kids knew the proper way to tackle, then that would help prevent a lot more injuries. 
You've got these parents that are putting these players in your hands, their lives in your hands, their safety in your hands. They're relying on you to keep them safe. I love football. I love the sport. I love what it does for kids. I love what it does for my, my child. But I want them to continue to play. And play safely, play correctly, and have fun at the end and everyone walk off that field. There's this fellow in California named Bobby Hosea who has all but given his life to teaching kids how to tackle more safely so that football can continue in much the same way it always has with kids getting hurt less often by keeping their head up and out of the tackle. See, I ain't never hit nobody with my head. I ain't putting my head in there. That's what you should teach a kid. Watch the head, keep that head up. That's what you're teaching. Of you, be better than them. Make them work. Full speed. Set, hit. The game is a great game, but we got to fix it. It's so important at this level to teach how to properly tackle because they're just starting out. So if you teach them from the get-go, from the start, how to properly tackle, they don't know the wrong way to tackle. They just know the right way to tackle, the correct way to tackle, the safe way to tackle. So don't be ginger. Run full speed. Don't slow down. Coming under control and slowing down are not the same thing. Football, it builds character, it challenges you. You get knocked on your back, you gotta get back up. Isn't that what life does to us? Whether it's Bobby Hosea's uh, high intensity tackle training system or anybody else uh, doing that same thing with the same goal in mind to keep kids safe, uh, it has to be mandatory. If it's not gonna be mandatory, then at some point um, injuries are gonna get worse, kids are gonna die. So every time you go into a pile, with your head down, you're really playing Russian roulette with your life, with your health, with your well-being. Every time. I learned to keep my head up and to rip and not wrap. Not to use my head in the tackle. He teaches how to tackle and dip and rip. Other kids should come to this camp because you can tackle correctly so you won't get a brain injury in football. Keep your head up so you don't break your neck. I work at a high school, so I watch the high school kids, and I kind of ask them, like, how do you tackle? And they still think, you know, it's like head first. Where did the head go? Oh. Did it go to the side? No. Oh. Did it go down? No. Oh. Why do we want the head to go every single time? Oh. Oh. I think that's essential that they teach it that way. And if they can teach keeping the head out of it, or keeping the head up, like we say, keep the head up, I think you're going to have a heck of a lot less concussions and, and neck injuries. <laughs> Wrap up, wrap up, wrap up, wrap up. This game is not about destruction. This game is about building character, physical fitness, toughness, intestinal fortitude, all those things. Take it for a ride now, go for a ride, get the air. The football players are made, they're not born. This is an acquired skill, this is an acquired knowledge. The hips control the head, but the arms accelerate the hips. And so when the hips accelerate, the head will accelerate. It'll come up and away from the ball carrier. And once they learn that, now there's no longer any fear. But nobody needs a bulging disc in the back of the neck. Nobody needs slurred speech because they've been hit in the head so many times. And nobody needs to be in wheelchairs because they played football incorrectly. Now they're, they're paralyzed for the rest of their life. Hip rip. In the last 20 plus years, good coaches, well-intentioned coaches, have been just saying, keep your head up. Just saying, keep your head up, isn't enough. There's a distinct difference between telling a player, keep your head up, versus going through a comprehensive tackle program that will instill muscle memory. They need to go to mandatory tackle camps. So when it comes game time, when it comes crunch time, they don't need to think about, oh, I need to keep my head up. They just do it. It's time for the adult community to step up and make games safe. The NFL and the NCAAs need to work with 
the youth level organizations to teach their future, the future of the NFL, the future of NCAA, to tackle properly and to be safe. It's not about anything but keeping these kids safe and, and making sure that when they're older that they look back on this and this was a positive experience and that they're healthy and they feel good and they love football. Instructing players to just keep their head up is no longer enough. And coming soon, my helmet-free tackle safety and performance training course to educate parents, players, and coaches on how to play safe, effective tackle football and reduce the risk of concussions, neck, and spinal cord injuries. Save our game one player at a time. Please visit www.gridironheroes.org and make a donation of any size to assist the over 50 players and their families that have suffered a catastrophic spinal cord injury with costs of their special medical needs these injuries present. Any and all donations you make will go directly towards the support of these wonderful athletes and their families. I thank you on behalf of the Gridiron Heroes Spinal Cord Injury Foundation.